I was teaching some youth, uh, actually here, and we were uh, discussing uh, the topic of gender issues. Uh, many of them were struggling with gender um, kind of, I don't know, things. And I decided, well, you know what I'm going to do is give a nice lecture on the biblical understanding of how the Bible you know, speaks to the topic of gender. And I gave a, a brilliant lecture. And I just remember as I'm giving this lecture that several of the kids were looking at me like I was absolutely crazy. Like I had, they couldn't believe that, you know, probably somebody as smart as myself couldn't understand something so basic and simple. And they were probably just a mirror reflecting the way I was speaking to them. I couldn't understand how they couldn't grasp such basic uh, concepts. And I decided uh, to kind of use, you can kind of see uh, uh, our illustration, the illustration of a of an iceberg. So we're having this discussion, but I wanted to uh, kind of go below the surface. I realized that as I'm giving out these ideas in this discussion, hitting this iceberg, nothing was moving, and it just felt like these ideas were ricocheting all over the room, and that it wasn't getting through, and that I hadn't really done any work to get below the surface to talk about why it was that we were not connecting. And I, w I, I referred to this as our worldviews, that there was different worldviews that I had made the assumption, hey, we're at church, we all kind of believe basically the same thing. And I realized that we didn't, that there were very different understandings of the world that were lying below the surface so that what was happening above the surface in the discussion wasn't really going anywhere or all that helpful. I grew up... Um, yeah, it's nice. My mom's here. My sister's uh, joining us online. JR is with us. Shelly's with us. Good to have you guys. Uh, when I was a kid, from about the age of zero to 15, I was exposed to very little in the world. I was homeschooled. I, had, I wasn't in a public education system. We, we, we didn't li listen to popular music. I had no social media accounts at that time. Uh, there was uh, basically, I went to church and I hung out with people who were in the church or were, were Christians. And so I made some pretty big assumptions. I was taught uh, basically two primary things. One is that, that there was a God who was a person and that by his word, he has written down the laws. So all of my ethical decisions, all my, my concepts of morality came from this idea that there was a God who determined what was right and wrong. He wrote it down in his word and it was up to us to respond to that. I see some probably just shaking their head. Yeah, that makes sense. And the other thing that I learned was that I was a sinner, that I was born into sin, and that I, by nature, always would go against God, and that all the problems in the world, which I knew of just a handful at that time when I was young, uh, but were as a result of people disobeying God. That was the uh, basic, my understanding of that there's a God and that people were sinners. And then there's the gospel message that's thrown in there. But I wanted to focus more on this idea that the biblical worldview has those two primary concepts. Man is sinful, God is holy, he's a person, and he gives us his law, his morals, ethics come from his word, which is why it's called a biblical worldview. And so up until I was about 15, I didn't really know anything other than that. And I realized as I was talking to these kids, to go back to my illustration of the youth, that they, growing up, probably had never heard those ideas in the music they listened to, in the movies they watched, anything in their education that they went to school, on their social media account. Nobody was saying any of those things. In fact, it's very likely they never even heard those when they were at home with their family. They may have barely heard them when they were at youth group or at church at some point. Uh, ideas about them, but they were never really taught. In fact, they were taught a different worldview, a worldview that I ran into when I was in college that I began to kind of understand. And we would call that worldview, it's the dominant worldview, I think, of society today, and that's secular humanism. And secular humanism has this uh, a different kind of idea of what is right and wrong, how we determine ethics. Because in every discussion that we're having, every dilemma uh, in regards to morals, um, or what's right and wrong. Underneath it is an assumption of how we come to determine what is right or wrong. And so I was in this class, I was like in, I don't know, it was philosophy of religion or something, and there was this teacher, and she was teaching and explaining that, you know, every single religion in the world basically has these certain tenets that are all the same. Let's just take uh, the most famous, and that is thou shalt not murder. And so everybody kind of has 
an idea that we shouldn't murder one another. That's a nice moral thought. We can kind of build some momentum as far as unity on not murdering each other, at least you would imagine that was the case. And uh, the problem, of course, is that with all these different religions, they all have different gods. And so secular humanism basically is an idea that says, let's get rid of the God side of it. We're, we don't have any gods. All of these, the Bible and every other book that was written is written by human beings, and they all have something in common. They all have uh, a desire for safety, a desire to not endure pain. And so the issue of pain is really at the center of secular humanism, not causing pain as a human being to another human being is how we determine what is right and what is wrong. And so if it causes pain to other people or to yourself, then it's wrong. If it doesn't cause pain, if it causes blessing or help, then it's good. Those are the two uh, ways in which we kind of determine what is moral. We don't have a, a Bible or a particular worldview. Um, or, or a particular text that we all kind of agree on. We all agree that as humans, we're autonomous, we're individual, we experience pain. And so there's no God. The issue of not causing harm is how we determine what's right or wrong. The other side of that is that they looked at human beings, and instead of talking about sin, they would say humans at, you know, at best are good in nature as a child, and at worst, they are neutral. They don't have any good or more morals until they are taught. And so that's the, the secular humanist kind of view of human nature is not that it's bad, it's, it's by nature neutral or good, and that it just needs to be guided. In other words, why do, why do kids bully one another in school? The, you know, as a Christian, we say, well, because they're sinners and they like to disobey God who gave them the command to love their neighbor, right? But a secular humanist would say that they're causing harm or injuring somebody else because they have been injured. So they've been taught pain, and so they then uh, put that pain on somebody else. And so, um, so that's the kind of two things. I want to bring them into kind of political, our, uh, kind of our political sphere. On one side, you would say that a you know, biblical worldview tends to be what's called conservative. And conservatives, and, and a lot of times people you know, intermix them, but they're different ideas. But conservatives have a basic principle that human nature needs to be restrained. People by nature tend to break laws. They tend to have uh, a natural tendency to create problems. And so you have to have laws and things that restrain them. Secular humanism uh, tends to produce a, a, a political ideology called progressivism. And progressivism teaches that people are actually evolving. They're becoming better in society. They are not, they don't need the traditions. They need new things and ways to kind of get out of the old and into newer eras where we can be better than we once were in the past. We learn from the past to keep society moving further and further. So conservatives tend to be like, we gotta stay with tradition. That kind of restrains people. And progressives tend to say, no, we need to kind of liberate uh, people. And so these are the two kind of places in which there's conflict within society. And Christians usually find themselves, uh, to some degree, influenced by more conservative ideas because of our worldview teaching that people are, by nature, sinner and sinners and need to be constrained. In the middle of that is, and by the way, these two worldviews have had huge influence over one another over time. Uh, Secular humanism, progressivism goes way back over hundred, a couple hundred years into the Enlightenment, uh, and biblical worldview goes back even further, and they've had a great deal of influence at different times uh, in Western society and in history. In the middle of that, and uh, by the way, I've just kind of been forgetting to go through my notes here. There we go. Oh, next week, we're going to talk about ultimate authority and justice, and then we're also going to talk about um, the following week. Uh, kind of what our hopes and dreams are. So uh, that's just a little update. So we walk through biblical uh, worldview, a, uh, a secular humanist worldview, and then um, let me just put that up there, conservative and, and progressive. In that middle green area is liberalism. We oftentimes associate it with progressivism, but it's actually the same. Uh, it's not the same thing. It's a political concept that actually says you can have two separate worldviews that coexist. And not only do they coexist not by getting along, they coexist by 
being angry and yelling at each other and, and, and fighting about things. Uh, and so you can have, uh, and this is why the freedom of, of speech is so important and at times been defended one way or the other. And so you'll see uh, kind of in modern society, at least in, in American society, we have this issue of freedom of speech as a good indicator of where we're at in terms of influence of, of progressivism versus conservatism. You'll ask us a question, who's being censored? And, uh, and there have been times in the past where people have been censored by conservatives, and there's been times now where conservatives are being censored by progressives. But there's that, those little red dots represent these kind of flashpoints. And I think that w what's happened in, in modern society is we're seeing kind of this pressing of a uh, progressive uh, worldview, a secular humanist worldview that is pushing further and further into places, into spaces politically and socially uh, that uh, you know, conservative or biblical worldview uh, has had kind of freedom and enjoyed great deal of liberty, and in fact, maybe even been in, in the majority or not finding themselves in the minority. And that's where, as Christians, I want us to be thinking, how do we engage in, that, in those circumstances, knowing that? Um, to go back, and I'll just close up here, to kind of go back to my you know, original story is, is how do we then engage with people? I, I've been wrestling with that. Is there a way forward? If there are two separate worldviews, what's really going to happen is we're going to engage in that, on that discussion, uh, the top part of the um, iceberg, and probably it